Hello, everyone, again. Welcome to Automating Success. I'm your host, Joe Langton. Today, I'm here with David uh, Pietricola. I literally just asked David how to say his last name, and I think I just messed it up, but David will fix it when he introduces himself. But um, just so everybody knows, as always, I'm always excited to talk to people that are innovating the space in automation, and David is no different. Um, and David... Why don't you just go ahead and introduce yourself and say your last name properly, and uh, we'll, we'll get into it from there. Sounds good, Joe. Now, you, you had it pretty much spot on there. Yeah, David Pietrocola, um, and I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of Cohesive Robotics. Uh, we're based out in New York City, and uh, you know we're on a mission to develop and deploy smarter industrial robots to modernize uh, manufacturing's most common fabrication and finishing processes. Awesome. So I don't know why I second guessed myself on the last name. I, I think I was had a little anxiety about it before I came on the show and I should have just believed in myself. So uh, I, I apologize. So, so David, you know, industrial robots, they've been around for a long time, but until recently, they they've kind of just been like the automotive sector, stuff like that. What what do you think is driving uh, the movement to kind of get them adopted in different sectors? Yeah, so the you know a big driver I think recently has certainly been uh, the emergence of collaborative robots. And, you know, being able to easily or as, as easy as possible um, within reason to program a robot by moving it around, having simplified safety uh, requirements um, has really opened the door for deploying robots into scenarios and for manufacturers with limited resources than had previously been possible with traditional industrial robots, which were those big, heavy, enormous payload, very fast moving, very dangerous industrial robots that have a lot of requirements that go with it. So there's definitely been this emergence of more types of hardware that's more accessible with, with lower, um, I, I guess, infrastructure and resource requirements. Um, and that's on the hardware side. And then on the software side and sensor side, you know, we see that across industries and, and sectors, right? With AI, computer vision, um, and a use of, of machine learning um, to do things that really were, were very difficult or, or nearly impossible to do, say, 10, 15 years ago. Um, those, those are really becoming, uh, emerging into commercial systems today that are robo robust and reliable enough uh, to get deployed in, you know, in production um, and not just in a research lab somewhere. Great answer. So when you're putting robots into high mix manufacturing environments, what's what's kind of complex about that? You know, I mean, like, I mean, obviously I'm a guy that puts robots out on lawns, right? And it's people, it's really not that complex when you break it down, you know, but but in this space, what's what's complex? So traditionally, right, when you're you're programming a robot particularly traditionally in, in an automotive space, you know, it might take hours, days, or even weeks to, to program a robot to do certain movements, to, to work on a certain part. And if you have to change that part or retool, that's, that takes a lot, long time. You know, it uh, takes down the line um, and it's become a huge challenge, right? When you're deploying uh, robots. So in high mix, you're talking about companies that, might have hundreds of SKUs that they're working through either each year, or they change from shift to shift, or even hour to hour and job to job. And so, when when you traditionally, if you have to reprogram that robot every time for those different parts that might change from job to job or shift to shift, the ROI to deploying a robot in those types of environments hasn't really made sense. Um, yeah, it hasn't been justifiable for a lot of manufacturers until recently with, with cobots and then with systems and technologies like ours, we're really kind of redefining the amount of programming that's needed to deploy a robotic system into those environments. 
And so now there's a lot more, um, a lot more options out there for manufacturers to really embrace automation and robotics um, and get them into places that weren't really possible, um, you know, even a few years ago. So, and, and this is, you know, there's a lot of parallels, like as, as I interview so many people, it's, you know, the, the collaboration moves so much forward, right? And, and that's why I do the podcast to bring as many minds on and just kind of learn from each other. So one of the things I always like to learn about is the individual's journey, right? So, so tell me about your journey in the robotics and automation uh, space. Um, you know, from your early days to becoming CEO of Cohesive. Yeah. So I actually grew up in the metal fabrication world. Um, you know, my father is, a in the ironworks business, um, you know, came over from, from Europe, you know, as an immigrant and, uh, you know, kind of built up his business, um, in, in the New York area. And so I kind of grew up in that world of metal fabrication and welding and, um, you know, the, you know, deploying, uh, systems, uh, you know, metal fabrications uh, uh, to commercial and residential environments. Um, but actually, you know, my education and training was, was in robotics um, and I did engineering, um, you know, graduate school in engineering. So I kind of went through that traditional track of, uh, you know, going through and, and being, uh, you know, trained in, in different types of robotics uh, uh, field. And so, you know, I worked in that area for for a number of years deploying these really um, elaborate impressive systems mostly for automotive and mostly in logistics um, where they can justify the price tag and you know doing an integration that might take years to do um, but you know what I was seeing you know, as I was looking to to do my own thing is the giant gap between the robotics deployed at that scale and the types of robotics that's getting into smaller manufacturers. And I looked back, you know, my, my upbringing in, in metal fabrication and saw, and I looked back at that today and seeing, you know, you know, what's the state of the art of metal fabrication today, for example. And there's been some improvements, but in terms of robotics uptick and adoption rates, still significantly lacking. And so, you know, we really wanted to see how we could distill some of those capabilities and bring them down into a way and package them up that was accessible um, and affordable and flexible enough so that we could deploy um, you know, more automation solutions uh, into these smaller operations, these high mix operations um, to address things like labor shortages, uh, protect workers from, from hazardous and ergonomically challenging uh, tasks. And that was really uh, you know, kind of our big focus. Um, so that's kind of been, you know, my journey, mostly in the robotic space. Uh, I did, you know, take a, a few pivots here and there, you know, through, through my career and worked in government for a little bit, um, in, in uh, scientific research and national security. Uh, so I've seen, seen quite a bit, but I think the common theme is, you know, I, I love a great challenge to, to integrate complex technical solutions into, uh, you know, really difficult, uh, mission critical environments. So then what inspired you? I mean, it sounds like, you know, you were seeing, uh, kind of the bigger, obviously automation and all these bigger, large scale environments, what inspired you to bring it to some of these smaller, and maybe you've already kind of hit on a little bit in the answer, but I want to kind of focus on the inspiration to bring it into these like smaller manufacturing and logistics space. So, I mean, did you just see the need uh, in, in your prior experience or uh, do you think that they could actually benefit from it more uh, than some of these bigger players? Yeah. I mean, a lot of it was certainly during, during COVID and that whole conversation about reshoring and people talking about disruptive supply chains and um, you know, the, the issue, right. And now is, is these are jobs that a lot of people don't want to be doing. Um, they're very, especially it's finishing, which is our target, uh, our initial target application. Um, it's, it's a tough job. It's really hard. Um, a lot of places it's kind of an entry level job and, uh, you know, for a company that wants to add another shift 
or increase production or, or um, increase profitability by reducing rework and, and scrap rates. Um, it, it's, it's a tough problem to solve. And so, you know, I, I looked at, you know, where, I mean, especially comparing to maybe certain sectors in, in Europe or Asia that have really embraced uh, automation. Um, you know, I wanted to see how we could do our part to continue to streamline um, the accessibility of robotics and automation into our sectors here in the U.S. specifically, um, particularly outside of automotive. I mean, there's been a huge growth in robotics outside of automotive the past few years. Um, and, you know, and we want to do our part to, to keep that trend going. Yeah, I think that I'll... So often, I mean, I literally just did a post on social media and, you know, it never fails. Five, five great comments. If for every five comments, there's one, you're taking a job or great, it's going to be more expensive and one less job. And I, I think that, A, you brought something up, you know, second, third shift, they can't find the worker in the first place. So most of the people that have an issue with automation and robotics, they're not in the business of hiring. But secondly, I feel like sometimes people don't talk about the increased quality you get in the automation side. So in particular, you said, you know, what you guys are doing is finishing. Besides the labor and the shifts, are you seeing um, a benefit in like quality control, like the controlled output you get from the automation? Yeah, I mean, and especially if, if, you know, you've ever done a woodworking project or, you know, buffed a car, right? You, you know how, how challenging it could be to, to do that type of work with a sander um, or other finishing tool. Um, and so generally with a robotic solution, with our solution, you know, we, we aim to have improvements of about 30% in terms of production rate, um, right? So the robot can do you know, certain parts up to about 30% um, in terms of improvement there. Um, and that's just direct you know, time improvement where the real additional benefits are that a lot of folks don't think about right away are in, for example, like rework and scrap rates where we're certain types of products, particularly you know, brass or um, you know, certain wood products that are really technically challenging. Um, you know, if you apply a sander too long in one area or too forceful, you might have to rework that whole part or even scrap it. And so, you know, some manufacturers have to deal with 30, 40, 50% or more in terms of rework rates. And by the time a product gets to a finishing department, a lot of time and resources and money have gone into getting the product to that state. Um, so that, that's a huge problem. Um, and that's a huge, uh, win where, where automation can help. Um, and then the third, you know, third piece is in terms of the actual, and I'm getting technical now, Joe, but, um, you know, the abrasives, everyone might apply sanding in a different way. You know, they might get trained and, you know, they learn during a shift, you know, how to apply uh, the sanding or polishing uh, for a certain product to actually do the work, um, but they might apply pressure differently or their speed might be a little different. And so the wear on that abrasive might become premature where the cut isn't optimal. And so that the company actually ends up burning a lot of cash in terms of cycling out those abrasives more than they might need to. Um, so we do target you know, about a 50% improvement um, in the use of those abrasive consumables. And then beyond that, there's, you know, the indirect benefits of, of automation that, that you're familiar with, you know, I'm sure the audience is in terms of, you know, liability protections and keeping workers, you know, out of those, those hazardous jobs. And now you're just using their domain expertise to control those systems, you know, to make tweaks, to, uh, oversee, and then work on some of those more custom uh, higher end uh, parts, those higher value uh, parts that um, you know, the robotic system might not be great at. I love that you actually brought up the abrasives 
Um, and I like that you got technical with that because um, there's these are all the hidden things that most people that are not in the space would not even think about, you know, is the benefit. And I go back to every time someone hears automation, they think labor replacement. And a lot of times it's not that at all. I mean, I, I've seen automation handling these sharp pieces of metal, which, you know, same thing, like I, with what you're doing. And you look at how many injuries would get, would get uh, decreased or maybe even go away. Yet, I'm always surprised, and I don't know if you have a comment on this, because maybe you're seeing it different in your space. Insurance companies seem slow to adapt to, for the companies using automation, for the risk mitigation that comes from it. Now, in your sector, are you seeing any of that yet? Or is it the same thing? They're kind of like, yeah, it is what it is. That person still has the same work comp rate, even though they're not touching the metal or anymore. Yeah, that's a great point, Joe. I I do think it's insurance industry might be lagging a little bit in, in that uptick. Um, so I, I would like to to see that pick up over the, over the next few years. And I think it will, um, especially as more and more facilities add robotics and automation, uh, you know, that, that should tick up um, in terms of seeing how to compete and keep work comp rates down. Um, you know, I think in, in terms of, uh, yeah, the, in terms of liabilities, right, protecting workers is certainly one focus area. Um, and then the extension of that is, you know, what if you have a great worker, um, super experienced and, you know, they might be close to retirement age. Yeah, they, our type of systems allow that person to, to they want to keep working, right, be able to extend um, and, and apply their domain expertise longer um, without, you know, taking that significant direct hit, um, you know, to their limbs uh, to do that, to, to do the actual work. But now instead they're applying their domain expertise, um, you know, to, to operate those systems. You know, you just brought up a great point that I don't think I've ever gotten into with, with a guest yet, but it just kind of works out perfectly. One of my last shows I was just on, uh, previous guests brought up the fact that in our country, we want to say, okay, we've hit 60 or we've hit 62, it's time to retire. But mentally, we're pretty much just becoming a master at our craft at that point. And I think a lot of blue collar jobs, people retire because the physical toll that's taken on their body is great, but mentally, they still have a lot to add. And there's a lot of people that are very technical, but necessarily wouldn't want to be in management, right? Like one of the things that I find without automation is once somebody doesn't want to do the physical task anymore, and I've done made the mistake myself, you tell them, well, if you don't want to do the physical task, you need to get into management. But now this kind of allows people to not have to manage people because a lot of people that are great at the work don't want to deal with people. So, it, it, you know, I mean, I just want to comment on what you said. I think it's great. And if you want to expand on it, I think that it keeps really experienced people in the space longer. Uh, and that's basically what you're saying you're seeing, correct? For sure. And, and uh, what is the statistic? I think it's like 10,000 baby boomers retire every, every day. Um, you know, that's, that's a significant hit to the workforce and, and all that expertise. Uh, that isn't necessarily getting replaced. Um, you know that that you know younger folks don't necessarily want to do those types of similar jobs, or at least go through the training, um, these entry level jobs to like get to the more interesting work. And so um, there's a lot of conversation about using robotics to to make these jobs more attractive and and you know retain some of that that talent. Um, so that, you know, kind of on both ends where the folks who are getting close to retirement are able to, you know, keep working and translate that knowledge and, and you keep that knowledge in, in industry longer um, while at the same time attracting younger folks into this space that, you know, they have a ton of options today and, and you know, trying to, to, to sand for, for all shifts every day, all day is is not as attractive um when you know there may be other options available for folks 
Yeah, well, and I want to stay on this topic for a second because I think that so often, you know, you look at labor charts and you look at, you know, people coming into a space versus leaving. And it's, you know, it's, it's always, I mean, even I think the way the, the graphs look, there'll be like one human being for every seven. And they show a body, right? Set seven to one or whatever, or one to one. But they don't actually show it properly because it's never a one to one. If If you have a 58 or 60 year old person that's been in a company 30 years retiring, they're not equal to the person coming in yet. Like the person coming in mentally is like, has a fraction of the knowledge. Um, so, so, you know, I always think it's interesting because when you do stuff with automation, like I, I can see this in my company, and I'm sure you'll be able to expand on this for your, uh, your company is, if if I have a group of people and, and we're getting the automation to function function better in its environment, okay? If I lose that person, I don't lose the functionality of that automation they've already worked on. But if they move on, the functionality that they've helped with still exists. So automation, it's interesting to see where that'll move us in quality. Because when you have these people that are adding to the functionality, I don't know that that's been measured yet. Would would you agree with that? I'd agree. Yeah, it, it it you know a lot of a lot of that secret sauce right in manufacturing is stuff that can't really put down on a on a, a CAD drawing or a more schematic, and um, you know it takes kind of that that honed expertise over the years. Uh, to really, you know, put out a good product and a high quality consistent product. Um, so, you know, we kind of have to, as an industry, uh, as an economy, reimagine some of these roles um, to make sure that, you know, we, we stay competitive um, globally. Uh, you know, I think that's, that's you know, really critical um, for, you know, for our economy. So... And as a lead inventor on multiple patents, according to the research we did, could you share some of the insights into the innovative solutions you've deployed in the impact on the industry? Like, I, you know, yeah. So, uh, you know, we, you know, I've worked on a lot of different um, products that, that have gone deployed into different industries and, and logistics and, and manufacturing, and you know, I think. A big value add, uh, especially that we're seeing in the past few years um, with the emergence of AI, is, is the use of of sensors, um, computer vision, um, you know, advanced controls. You know, those are all really starting to come into a lot of different types of automation products that are that are out there today, um, getting deployed into production systems. Um, so I think that's you know that's been a, a big focus of mine um, to work on those types of technologies. Um, and work with some amazing people um, and people who work across disciplines. And that's, I think, been a, a really common theme. Um, and anyone looking to go into this space or already in a space is well aware. Um, robotics and automation is a, is a very multidisciplinary uh, field. And so you really need to put together a, a great team that cuts across those disciplines. Um, to get a product together that works and, and can get deployed in the real world. Um, because it's, you know, a lot of things can fail, you know, a lot of things break um, and you don't necessarily where that failure is. And so um, you know, it's really critical to put together a great team, um, you know, across the different disciplines um, to all work together. So how do you see AI uh, coming into play? Uh, with transforming some of these systems and manufacturing and is cohesive robotics already kind of like figuring how that you're going to play into that or you not see it being a big benefit in what you guys do in your space yet? Well, we certainly, yeah, we certainly leverage some some of this uh, capability um, and, and look, are looking to do even more and more uh, this year and into next year with our roadmap. Um, I think a big I think focus of ours and, and for, for others in the sector is the emergence of uh, like this digital twin concept where you can have kind of this replica of your system um, in simulation and allows you basically to 
to do training, to do what if uh, scenarios, um, to really harden that system and make it more robust and train it against data that you couldn't really generate uh, sufficiently in the real world, especially with high mix applications. Um, there's just not enough data points out there um, for, for a specific part, specific manufacturer scenario. And so like that emergence of simulation and, and using AI to train on this synthetic data and supplement it with some real world, uh, but you know, using a lot of that synthetic information is, is really starting to drive a lot of more product innovation, a lot quicker innovation. Um, you know, even just this past year, uh, you know, I've seen some demos and, and demonstrations of uh, products at trade shows and online and, and in person. It just kind of blows me away of how quickly some of those capabilities have had developed and deployed. Certainly to, to get it from a demo to something that's used in production uh, with the uptime requirements, it's, it's a can be a very big gap there uh, but it's just very impressive to see some of the things that are out there today um, you know, especially like pick in place applications you know just to upload a CAD file uh, to a system and drop a bin of, of parts or widgets in front of a robot and have it figure out how to pick things and find them and move them to a conveyor for example I mean that's it's incredible, um, you know, the level of, of capability that an AI system is able to to leverage um, in those types of environments today. Uh, so, you know, we're we're excited about the the promise of AI and trying to deploy it slowly into into our systems. Because um, I know I think I think a lot of manufacturers specifically are currently playing catch up a lot with with a lot of the robotics. Uh, capabilities out there today and so we're we're looking to introduce things uh, gradually across across our roadmap um you know one thing we, we're looking at is like analytics and gradually improving the system over time so you know based on how the system is set up you know maybe from shift to shift week to week month to month you know we're we're observing the behavior of our system and then making changes uh you know, to to optimize certain parameters, certain metrics that that the customer uh, would like to have optimized, without somebody, you know, needing to sit there and really try to figure out what knobs to turn. I think that's you know a big promise of of the AI systems um, that we're already starting to see. So, what's your footprint like? Like, what what area, scope, and size do you, does Calisa Robotics serve? Uh, you know, is it like multiple state, one state, like where you guys go? Yeah, so we serve uh, across uh, across the country um, as well as Canada. Um, uh, the vast majority of our customers thus far are in the Northeast and Mid Atlantic area. Um, so that's that's kind of been our focus area. But certainly, you know, we 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 support in you know, the Midwest, uh, Upper Midwest. Um, you know, a big, big focus hour, focus areas right now. Um, and so, you know, we're just looking to continue to grow our team and, and make sure that we can deploy and support and service uh, our turnkey systems, you know, as, as we increase our deployments. Um, you know, but certainly we, you know, we want to deploy systems that are, you know, robust and, and reliable. Um, so that's certainly a big focus of ours. Um, you know, when we do deployments, you know, we, we try to keep training to a minimum, like you know, having a more intuitive system, uh, commissioning time, and you know, we try to keep that minimal. Uh, so those are you know, all things that we 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 aim for uh, when we when we do deployments and develop our product and make improvements. So I love that you said service your robots because that means you you are in agreement that robots are not fixing themselves yet. Um, and I, I, I think it's so crazy that you tell somebody, Hey, I'm in automation and I'm going to put in a robot and then they assume that it's just going to run forever, you know? So, you know, once you get them running, 
do you guys have people at the facility kind of service them? Do you do phone support or do your does your team do all the service for your customer? Yeah, so we we offer different tiers of of support. Um, you know, our base level is is remote support where you know we're you know we have con- remote connection into our system and we're able to to help and, and guide um you know the folks who we've trained on site um at the or you're at the company um you know to actually make changes uh and then we we have other levels of, of support where you know we have like same day uh support where we you know come in in person uh to actually you know service the, the system but yeah, I think certainly this one of the goals um, and focus areas for our turnkey approach is that you know we kind of you know own that whole system in terms of you know deploying a, a cohesive system and um, you know we we try to make sure that we can service that and and do the maintenance and and help uh, you know our customer do what they need to do in terms of keeping production going and we're fully aware that. To focus and help with small and medium-sized manufacturers, not everyone has automation staff um, internally. Um, maintenance staff might be limited, and so that's that's a really important aspect uh, that we look at when we're doing product developments and and deploying our systems. So, what would you say the percentages that you're finding? I, I kind of want to see if there's a parallel between what I see in my space and yours. Is you know. How many people do you have that are like, yeah, just get it set up and then give us phone support versus the people that want the turnkey? Yeah, it's I'd say a vast majority of our customers, right? They're looking at, you know, a turnkey system. Um, you know, we we try to get that deployed and commissioned as, as quickly as possible, um, you know, with limited training time. But uh, yeah, I'd love to your you know, you know what your experience is and, and your yeah no I mean, my experience is the same i mean we so so you know what i find and then we can build off this is yeah. i've almost gotten to the point where i don't want to sell systems anymore that my customers can touch or do anything to because then it actually messes with now did the customer make a change or is it is it something in the mechanical side so um i've almost gotten the point for our success to make it where and this is something I've been talking to my daughter. My daughter's my COO. It's I'm really blessed to have a 23 year old that's got about as much entrepreneurial spirit as you and I do. Um, is I told her I said I might just shut off selling anything direct and supporting it a la carte because a it puts a person in the mix that maybe is not qualified enough to be in the mix. And then when you talk about phone support. If I'm supporting one of my technicians, I can usually tell them within two minutes what to do or what they were missing versus sometimes I'm on phone support for three or four hours and I'm almost thinking I could have driven there, fixed it and gone, gone back. So that's my space. I, I don't know if you feel the same way, you know? For sure. Yeah. Uh, and I, yeah, I've experienced that from, you know, even large manufacturers in, in the automotive sector, um, you know, if they're touching knobs that they're not supposed to be touching um, or you didn't intend for them to, to be touching. Uh, that's a problem. <laughs> and so, um, you know, nobody wins in that scenario. And so, uh, yeah, I think it's really important for us. I um, mean, anyone deploying robotic systems, especially in the high mech space, smaller manufacturers of, you know, really focusing on that user experience, um, the HMI experience, uh, and, and you know, trying to develop a, an intuitive system um, that isn't easy to break. You know, that, that has some of that consumer tech uh, perspective uh, of some some robustness to that. Yeah, I mean, I you know, it's I mean, you brought up that you know, your kind of small to medium space is your focus, and you know, it's like I have set up a couple of people, a couple of landscapers in my in my field, and. and well, they've been on my podcast that, you know, they get to a certain amount of robots and now they have enough robots to have their own staff that maintains them. And then from there, you know, they, they run and do their own thing and that makes sense. But 
I, I think you brought up, I mean, if people are looking to do this to limit their, uh, their health with their staffing issues to then say, we're going to fix the robot. They're never going to have someone on staff that can do it in the first place. They're forgetting why they thought about using cohesive in the first place. Right. I, and, and the same thing for me with automated outdoors. So, you know, these are the conversations I like to have because the hope for me is people that are considering purchasing or working with companies like ours to automate really realize that they're likely already saving so much money anyways. It's something I'm always surprised. Like I heard you bring some metrics up of, you know, a 30% uh, increase in production, 50% less, uh, uh, you know, adhesive uh, sanding pads. And you start adding all this up and say, I don't know the numbers in your space, but let's say, I mean, this is your number out there. Let's say they're normally spending a million dollars a year to run that segment of the line and now they're going to spend six hundred thousand and now somebody decides they want to do it for five hundred and forty thousand because they're going to do it all themselves I, i'm always surprised like it's like you're saving four hundred thousand you don't have to staff that person but now you don't want me to do the full service right do you run into that in your space or maybe not as much as i do yeah i, I think there's always certainly uh some some price pressures there um I'd say, you know, folks certainly don't want to, you know, if they're saying they're manufacturing this widget, they want to be the expert in making that widget, not necessarily becoming that robot expert. Um, and so from a vendor perspective in, in the robotics industry, you know, the worst thing that can happen is somebody gets a robot, has a terrible experience, uh, and it sits in a closet. Or in a corner uh, forever, um, and then they just kind of disregard that as an option uh, in the future. And so I, I think as an industry, we have to be mindful of that and and not look into just you know sell something, um, but really trying to develop stuff and deploy things that you know can integrate well with with and understand a customer's workflow um, and their resource limitations. Um, and I think that gets back to our earlier conversation, Joe, about the workforce development and wanting to, you know, attract and retain talent into the space. You know, by having these types of systems in a, in a manufacturing environment, um, or even in a school environment, you know, if they go through trade schools or or associates programs, or bachelor programs, of you know, they get exposed to this, and then they, you know, by having these types of systems in their manufacturing uh, operations. You know, now you're attracting, you know, more talent in, into that space. And, um, you know, if you're a manufacturer, you're attracting that type of talent that you may not have otherwise been able to attract um, and get them into the, into the space. And so now, now over time, maybe then, then you do have um, staff internally that's going to be able to maintain these systems and do your own thing and, and make custom enhancements. And we, you know, I think over time we we want to see that type of capability. We want to see, um, you know, folks continue to innovate and solve their their problems, and then you know look to us for for that expertise and to fill fill the gaps with with um, you know core uh, capabilities and technologies. So you you brought you brought up the fact of bringing people into the field, and I see you're also uh, a lecturer at uh, University of Maryland. Um, I'm assuming that's your motivation to teach and speak is to bring people into the field um, or is there a different motivation uh, for that for you? Yeah, I've always been really uh, passionate about, about robotics and, and getting folks into the field. And um, now if you have anyone who's gone through say, like the first robotics experience when they're, you know, little kids, uh, you know, my, my alma mater, uh, Trinity College, had for a long time a, a firefighting robot contest um, that, you know, even kindergartners were, were doing with, with the little Lego Mindstorms. Um, you know, those are all things to, to motivate folks, to, to inspire them, to get them into, if it's not robotics, at least into the STEM fields. Um, so that's been definitely a, 
a passion of mine over the years. And you know, I, I've from from you know, my early career, I'm taking that then through. Uh, I spent a couple of years at the National Science Foundation, um, you know, helping develop those programs of getting folks into STEM fields at the graduate level. And uh, and then I did uh, for a number of years. I, I did stop a few years ago, but um, I, I was uh, a lecturer at the University of Maryland um, and teaching college classes in robotics and, you know, helping folks, you know, complete their master's programs in robotics. Uh, and I think a big focus of mine at that time and still today is beyond the academic, uh, traditional academic topics that you would learn in a robotics field. I was seeing as an employer a lot of gaps in terms of the software development and software engineering experience and expertise of, of students coming out of school. It's just not really something that gets taught in a lot of programs. And so that was that was my focus. Um, you know, I developed uh, courses and 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 taught them to to grad students. And so, you know, anytime I'm able to, you know, I, uh, lecturing or demonstrations or you know, going onto panels is having an opportunity to talk to the younger students, um, and you know, whether it's you know, K through twelve or, or undergrad and grad, um, you know, K through twelve, you're certainly looking to inspire folks and get them into the STEM field with robotics as a vehicle for that. Um, and then for undergrad and grad is how do you get them the skills they need to be successful in this industry? And that goes beyond academics. It's, it's those soft skills. It's the, you know, everything's, a lot of things are software now. Um, and it's learning all those, those, those CS, uh, com you know, computer science skill sets, um, but more so general software engineering um, and helping folks with the engineering expertise now evolve and develop those additional expertise so they can be more um, competitive in the job market and ultimately more successful because, you know, as an economy, uh, as a country, you don't want to invest so much resources into, into folks. They go through these programs, you know, they graduate and then they leave the field and, and you know, you're losing a lot of this talent into that go into other industries. Um, and so that's, it's really heartbreaking to, to see that when the folks you know, aren't able to continue that, that passion for whatever reason, or don't want to based on the state of the industry, or they didn't have that, that exposure to skill sets that end up being critical. And so I think that's, that's important to me. And, and I'm going to keep doing that and, and look for uh, ways to continue, uh, you know, encouraging and, and inspiring folks. Well, I know it inspires you because through this whole interview, you had a smile on your face the entire time you were talking about the teaching aspect. I can really mm -hmm. tell I hit on something you were passionate about. And I'm I'm glad I actually asked about it because I think that um, you know, you said a couple of things. I didn't I didn't think that this would give us so much to talk about, but yeah. I think that I do think it's interesting this space is gonna move so quickly that I don't know that the colleges, and I want you to expand on this because you'll be able to expand on it better than myself, are prepared. I don't know that they have the curriculum prepared to get people right into the industry. And, and I'll bring up my thought, and it's ironic, the timing of this. So I have a really talented uh, young woman that's working for us at AOS right now, and she's going to school for civil engineering. And she wants to work just with us in the worst way. But of course, her family is like, you went to school to be a civil engineer. You're going to intern as a civil engineer. And, you know, and I'm more than happy to help her get this. But one of the things I was bringing up to her is like, I know some of the AI stuff coming out and I'm working with some people, actually one of the people who've been on my podcast, where with all the drone footage and planes and all the stuff they can do for topographic mapping, there's going to be so much of this done with AI I question, like, if you go to school to be a civil engineer, how much are you going to be needed in 10 years? Because there's going to be a lot of this type of engineering that's just going to get plugged into an AI model, and it's going to spit you out an output right at your lat lawn. This is where you're at, right? So I think that when you're looking at this space and having, like, 
surrounding hardware with software and getting all of this stuff working, I think there's such an, an opportunity for jobs. But I don't know that there's any colleges that are really embracing and teaching it. That you know, and that's that's my feeling, anyways. But you can tell me if you think I'm off because it sounds like you're teaching it more than I am. So, no, you're you're, you're right on, Joe. Uh, I think there's always a lag, uh, especially in undergrad, um, you know, graduate schools. You know, graduate programs should you know adapt a little quicker. Um, you know, they're creating that tech that eventually becomes these commercial products. So, but it's only on the undergrad level. I think what's going to continue to be important and has already been important for, for decades is, is making sure that you're teaching students how to learn and be passionate about learning because technology is going to change. And, you know, what you learned in school five years later might not be the way the industry does something anymore. Um, and so I think whether you're in your manufacturing or you're developing the robotic systems yourself, your what's in your toolbox is going to change. Um, and so having those critical skills, those critical thinking skills and learning and motivation to learn and change is going to, to be essential. And um, I think any type of engineering program you go to, to for example, is Great. I mean, it sets you up with with those STEM skills, quantitative skills, you know, critical thinking and reasoning skills that are going to serve you well, no matter what field you go into. And so, I uh, I would say, yeah, I, I I think students should continue to become more comfortable with understanding and accepting that what they're learning in school isn't necessarily what they're going to be doing out, you know, in their careers, um, whether they stay in their field or go elsewhere. You take AI, for example, you know, before chat GPT came out, you know, we, we didn't, we didn't really understand what those capabilities were and how impressive they could be in terms of addressing a lot of problems in, in a lot of different areas, but then how you apply it to domain is going to be that, that really secret sauce and having folks, you know, understand how to use that as a tool to solve problems in their industry, um, I think is where that big value add is for, for anyone. Yeah, no, well said. I, yeah, it's like, I mean, basically I agree. I mean, it does give a good foundation. And that's, that's the advice I gave Grace was, you know, listen, you're going to have this degree. It's an engineering degree. You could move sideways up. Down. I mean, at least it gives you a footing to move from. So I, I do agree with you on that. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I look at it. I mean, like, even for us, like we've been trying to set up, you know, it's like all college campuses, they have grass to mill. And I'm like, hey, you should let me set up some internships where you have the people at the colleges working with us. We'll mow your grass. We'll teach them how to use the automation. But, you know, their their interest is like, well, no, I mean, we, we could make you one. And it's like, oh, listen, I understand that. And I understand that the college level, that's what you, you want to teach people to make the robots. But if someone maintains one, that's what's going to inspire them to make a better one. Right? It's like, if you just sit in a class and say, hey, let's come up with a concept. Let's come up with a concept and make something. Okay. It might not have any real world value. But if you take something someone else made and you're like, man, if they would have made it like this, I mean, I deal with this every day, except I didn't go to school for robotics because I, you know, I look at this every day, like, man, if they did this, this, and this, it'd be so much better. But to me, the value is always in the servicing of it, which is why I asked you about how you service yours, because at the end of the day, it all looks similar, but it's how it can, she or she that can keep it continuously functioning. That's where the real ROI comes in automation, in my perspective. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And I, th I think, you know, that's certainly maybe not so common, especially in undergrad, uh, education where, yeah, you're being taught how to design something, you know, from, from scratch and not necessarily maintaining existing. Um, so, you know, I think there's some, some room for, 
for improvement there and then yeah. helping helping those programs, helping faculty, you know, make those those adjustments and drive change at your local uh, academic institutions. I do think there's a lot of untapped potential when you're talking about trade schools and community colleges, when you're talking about automation and you know, moving beyond just like PLC programming, right? Is is starting to distill down some of these advanced capabilities and helping folks who don't necessarily need a you know engineering degree to to work on these things and maintain them, like you said, and make improvements um, for local manufacturers. I, I think that's the way we're going to be able to kind of build things up, and you know, you know, r- rising tide rises all boats, if you will. Yeah, yeah, totally. So. Are there any like memorable experiences from projects in your career that you've worked on that, you know, I mean, obviously you're doing, you, you have careers of robotics, but I mean, you have a vast background, you know, it looks like, I mean, you were Walgreens and looks like maybe Daimler Chrysler, right? like uh, Daimler, right? Um, but anything outside of Cohesive that you've worked on robotically, that's like a cool project that very memorable for you. Sure. Yeah. I, I, you know, we worked on a uh, pretty cool project in, in the automotive space. Um, there are actually, I think still today, it's considered the world's largest, what they call virtual conveyor system. So basically instead of, so like a car manufacturer where you have body, you know, body shop where you're welding together the car bodies and, and then they get sent to, to auto, um, assembly and paint. Um, the traditionally, right. Those are, those are all on these big conveyors that go from welding cell to, to, you know, cell to cell. Um, and if you want to provide any sort of customization or changes to the line, um, or in the product, yeah, it's, it's a lot of effort to kind of rip out that conveyor and, and, you know, send it somewhere else. And so, you know. Yeah, I was on a team that that deployed this the system where instead of conveyors, it was actually these AGVs, automated guided vehicles that were holding these these car bodies and taking them into each respective cell. And so you could actually reroute them. So say you wanted to get like a custom piece made, you know, a custom option um for for this for a certain car, you could reroute um you know that product. That the car body to to the special work cell, or if it needs rework, or you know, if you want to retool year to year, um, it gives a lot more flexibility um, to those operations now. And so, you know, it, it kind of opens up that door of, of really interesting manufacturing capabilities, where uh, you know now you can have more bespoke capabilities, where you're like customizing, say, car to car. Um, in very different ways um, than you're able to today. And so, you know, uh, you know, as part of Cohesive, you know, we were looking to, to how we distill some of those technologies and capabilities that, that I was exposed to at that time um, and, you know, integrate them into, into something that makes sense for the smaller manufacturer and having, you know, kind of look into that future, if you will. So. So that was a that was a pretty cool project. Um, spent a long time on the on the body shop floor, a uh, long time away from home uh, as well, um, which my uh, my wife didn't love. Um, but you know, it was it was a great experience, um, and and it kind of you know, goes back to you know needing a great team, and you know we had technicians, PLC programmers. Advanced software engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, manufacturing engineers, all, all working on that effort. Um, and, you know, it was, it, was, it was a great project to work on. And, you know, I was very proud of that and, and the people and, and team I worked with then. So, um, so now with Cohesive, you know, we're, you know, I'm, I'm excited to, to continue that journey and, and try and, help smaller manufacturers have that same level of success with their automation project. So, you know, this will kind of round out the 
questions on any sort of automation, but you know, what is uh, what do you see that co- like the future of cohesive robotics? You know, do you have any? I mean, you just kind of brought up it's a good segue to what you're trying to do. Like, um, is it going to be business as usual for for the time being, or you have some cool stuff that you can talk about that's coming out? Any changes? Oh yeah, Joe. We uh, we have a, a big wish list and a roadmap uh, of you know things we want to we want to work on. Um, you know, I think you know certainly right now our our, our focus is on our, our flagship product, the smart finishing robotic work cell. You know, focusing on surface finishing, material removal applications. Uh, but you know, really our core technology, we you know we develop a, a core software stack that sits on top of industry, um, you know, off the shelf proven hardware. And when we integrate that all into a turnkey system, but you know, our, our big value add our big investment of the company in R and D is on the software side and, you know, the AI and perception side. And so, you know, we're going to continue doing that and, and looking to expand into different types of offerings and, you know, our, our vision to continue modernizing a lot of different common processes in manufacturing and, um, you know, I, I think of it more as how do we move into a vision of software defined manufacturing? And I think that's, that's kind of the driving mission that, that keeps me thinking at night, it's right. Is, is being passionate about that and, and how do we, how do we explore what I mean by that, right? How do we, how do we have this software defined vision of, uh, a reconfigurable factory, um, and what type of products can that make and envision? What type of uh, infrastructure and where do we place these manufacturing facilities? And you know, can we create more sustainable manufacturing operations? I, I think that's that's some really exciting um, topic right there. Is is you know where does this lead to? You know, in the next couple of years and five, ten, fifteen years down the road. Yeah, that's a lot of stuff in the future, but it sounds exciting. <laughs> you know, that's that's for sure. Now, now, now I really see. I kind of wish I had started with that question. You know, you you really like like I seem really passionate about that. So I'm glad I asked to round it out. So you know, you brought up your wife not being happy about being away. So a, where do you live? B, uh, you know, tell me about your family uh, and the things you like to do outside of uh, robotics. Yeah, so I, uh, I I live in in New York City uh, with my wife and and uh, toddler uh, son, and um, so you know we we're all about embracing everything that that's available to us, being being in the city and uh, taking advantage of you know all the cultural institutions, museums, Central Park. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a I grew up uh, in in the area, so you know, big. Uh, big sports fan as well. And so, you know, we, we love to do those things, do outings, um, you know, do, do art at, at some of the, the great museums, uh, in the city and, uh, just trying to keep up, you know, having a toddler, um, it's, uh, it's been, it's, it's a great experience, uh, to, to be a parent. So that's, um, that's been, uh, it's a great journey. Um, and yeah, so, uh, you know, we're loving that and, uh, you know, just, yeah, keeping keeping the, the journey going. So you're a sports fan. What what what's your favorite sport then? <laughs> oh, I don't want to alienate anyone, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I am a I am a New York Yankees fan. So um, I'm sorry, very uh, nice. To everyone about that, but <laughs> yeah, good thing I I you know I come I'm from Illinois, so we have two baseball teams and. I always tell people I pick the Cubs because I like blue. So you, you're not going to offend me at all. I'm not a big baseball guy. Football, on the other hand, big Bears fan. Pretty happy about uh, how we're setting our team up this year, but we mm-hmm. set ourselves up for failure many years. So we'll we'll see how this pans out for me. You know. Yeah, so. uh, I wish you guys best of luck with the new yeah. new retooling. And um, yeah, I'm also a, a a big soccer fan. So I. Uh, I follow MLS and also some of the European uh, leagues. So we're passionate about that. And it's great to see the, that sport grow. 
uh, recently. So uh, over the past few years, so that's great. So you said you, you said you you say earlier your dad immigrated here, or like you're from Europe. You said, or, yeah. So like we're like, what about your younger version of you that that side of the family besides your wife and your toddler? Yeah. So I um, yeah, both my parents actually are from Italy. So they, they from Italy. Over. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so my my uh, dad is from uh, Puglia, like the the heel of the boot in Italy. Okay. Um, and he he learned to do metal work and fabrication from from his older brother, uh, who has a who had an ironworks business near Milan, up in northern Italy. And uh, and then my mom's side is from uh, Salerno, which is uh, kind of just south of Naples, Italy. So I got the two. The two coasts of southern Italy in my family, so it's it's always great to to go back, uh, you know, when I can, um, you know, every few years. And uh, I I was fortunate enough to to be able to study in Italy during during my undergrad years, so that was that was a great experience. Um, so I have a you know deep soft spot for for the city of Rome uh, where, where I studied. So that was, that was a great experience. So my uh, my mom. Is hundred percent Sicilian, and uh, her parents. So they came from Altavilla Um uh, So that's that's where. So when you said, I assumed Italy from your name, but then uh, you threw me for a loop when you're like, my dad came from Europe, and I was like, why don't we just say Italy? So it's kind of funny, <laughs> but, you know. So but, uh, know, some some people think it's it's a Greek name. So no, I, yeah, I, no, I I had a feeling it was Italian. But yeah, so anyway. But I've never had the privilege of going back. I um, it's ironic because I have a love for the water. I love the ocean. I love seafood. And when I finally realized for my grandma, I mean, I mean, literally, I'm 45, and when I my grandma's still alive, she's 93. So hopefully, I have her genes. But the uh, the reality is, she's like, oh yeah, we came from Malta Vila and Nielsen. I'm like, it took 40 years for me to find this out, you know. So I started like looking it up. So. Anyway, it's pretty cool. So I, ironic that we're, that at least one side of me is from there. Um, so yeah, well, excellent. So I mean, I really enjoyed having you on the show. We're we're over an hour here, and people lose lose. Uh, I lose people after an hour on this podcast, apparently, as my producer says. So I think this is a good spot to end it. I want to tell you, I appreciate you being on the show, and I wish you the best of luck with Cohesive Robotics, and I hope all those visions that you have for the space i i fully trust you're going to make it happen thank you joe thank you for for having me on the show and uh yeah i appreciate the opportunity great talking to you awesome